Thank you. So the title of my um, lecture is about the cultural challenges in forensic investigation, uh, specifically in Southeast Asia and, of course, in the Philippines. There are a lot of um, problems that are um, actually uh, encountered by the forensic science, especially in the cultural aspect. As we all know, forensic science, well, the proposal is to expand the knowledge and skills in investigating and, of course, the research. Try to educate more uh, social and behavioral sciences, such as psychology, educate and hire sociologists, linguists, and cultural anthropologists in forensic science, because most of the forensic scientists in the Philippines are lawyers and, of course, accountants and colleagues. Encourage a special and different kind of environment, of course. Include people from a wide variety of science, culture, and diversity in order to provide innovative solutions to challenging forensic issues. As we all know, race is a category also, the, uh, the, uh, the age, of course, and the gender. What is the rationale of this um, talk? Actually, um, we are pro um, proposing the research in a different um, uh, kind of team. It's multidisciplinary method. Of course, when you say multidisciplinary methods, it's more of homogeneous team um, uh, for the forensic alone. But for the, uh, for the multidisciplinary, there's the diversity of thinking, viewpoints, and experiences that makes possible to answer new questions and issues about forensic science. Hold on. When defining forensic science, of course, we all know it's a scientific and techniques on law problems that covers a variety of disciplines, including biology, mathematics, engineering, and chemistry, mostly with a natural sciences background, specifically in the Philippines. The broad uh, scientific disciplines contribute to many forensic areas needing specialists and training. As you can see, the most common these are natural sciences. If you add culture, and of course people, this is a new common forensic discipline. In forensic uh, predictive diversity, um, some of the institutions now are recognizing the need to enhance diversity in forensic science and have undertaken strategic planning process focused on expanding the pool of diverse talent especially in forensic science, and, and of course, in collaboration with the behavioral sciences disciplines. I'm not being biased by behavioral sciences, but as of now, culture is very important, especially in identifying and, of course, investigating in a specific crime scene. Uh, they need to address how culturally sensitive is the test selection, because some of the um, some of the investigators here, they just go and pop up and then there's no more um, communication with the family. Of course, now the international human rights and cultural sensitivity have considered race, gender and religion, application to criminal matters as, are still in the infancy. That's why we are proposing cultural anthropology as part of the curriculum in forensic science. Now, what is cultural competency? Why is it so important to consider cultural competency skills? As the legal experts, they are beginning to recognize the possible cultural effect differences, cultural differences on the client contact with the trial law, uh, lawyers. It is important for the decision maker to react to the client's inherent humanity while researching and providing anecdotal facts about the client's life. It's more of representing him as a member of the human community. As you can see, there's knowledge, attitude, and skills. And with this three integration, you will get the cultural competency. When you say cultural competency, this is the integration and transformation of knowledge, information and data about the individuals and group of people into a specific clinical standard skills services, approaches, and techniques. And most of the time, it is the increasing of individual culture and appropriate 
appropriateness of method. In the continuum of a cultural co uh, competency, as you can see, if there are investigation, most of the time there's the cultural destructiveness. I don't know um, what is happening in the situation in the Philippines, but most of the time that is the, that are the cases. And there's a lot of investigation all over and over to, uh, to just to validate all the data. And there's, of course, some of the uh, police, there's cultural incapacity, there's cultural blindness, and of course, cultural pre competence and cultural competence and proficiency. Of course, when you say cultural competence, people can grasp the reason and behave effectively when faced with cultural diverse situations, specifically the self-awareness on specific um, cases like crimes and disasters. Um, when you say community for forensic, um, this is important because um, you are, the forensic scientists are engaging with the client, of course, the victim's family in a cultural competent manner. It will also lessen the likelihood that differences in culture will create bar uh, barriers to communication and understanding and trust. This is so critical given the reality that we have different perspective, geography and culture, and a significant factor in determining the normative belief, especially in understanding what is death, what is a crime in a specific community. Okay, so the field of forensics has developed over 30 years, especially in the Philippines also. They have that, though they have this expertise, so-called expertise, but at the same time, they are unfamiliar with the context of the communities and cultures. So the significance of cultural anthropology in the forensic investigation are the cultural beliefs regarding the dead and missing. Okay, We all know that this is just part of the uh, forensic investigation, but this, is, this has a big role in understanding the community and how they feel about those investigators. So we need to comply regarding the ethics, accountability, principles, integrity, and values. Most of the practitioners, they find the standard forensic operating procedures, they are familiar, but they do not articulate well with the cultural beliefs involving the dead and the missing. We all know that, especially on the, um, the cases like disaster in the Philippines, we have a lot of disasters actually. Um, cultural relativist view must be taken. Okay? Failure to take cultural needs and expectations into consideration unless properly considered have a direct effect on the investigation. Sometimes they don't actually cooperate. All right, in the Philippines, there are lots of um, different ethno-linguistic groups. We are actually uh, different islands. We have different cultures. Same with the different, uh, same in Southeast Asia. Okay, of course, particularly I'm talking about our, my culture. Okay, some ethno-linguistic groups, actually they believe in spirit and some villages close by where a disappearance is believed to be fearful that any investigation or excavation will disturb ghosts of the dead. So you cannot just do investigation unless you do a particular steps in uh, conducting this kind of study. So in the Filipino, among the Filipinos, we have a lot of superstitions that we still follow. And ethnographic study is very important in studying this spiritual and social practices among the deceased of the community. If not properly navigated, the belief agency of the disease will adversely affect the investigation. Okay, another uh, a good example um, is the um, uh, plane crash in Vietnam that they conducted um, cleaning of the bodies, a cleaning of the souls to appease the spirits of the dead crew before any work can be performed. You cannot perform um, investigation without 
having this kind of ritual. Why? Because disrupted spirits are thought to cause nightmares, disease, and craft failure to communities in the immediate region. Among the Muslim and Jewish traditions, the body is buried as soon as possible from the time of death. And autopsies are discouraged in most cases as it is viewed as desecration of the body. Same with the case in our in the recent case in the Philippines that the uh, the the victim they thought it was um, after she was great, but unfortunately they thought also that she died in the natural death. But there's no um, um, in in the investigation there's autopsy, okay, but they didn't ask the permission of the family prior to that autopsy. So what are those um, rituals that you could uh, encounter if you are investigating in our country, in uh, different communities in the Philippines? The villages actually, um, they believe the effects of the angry spirit, especially if rituals did not occur and those who offended the mind would be responsible, okay? If this purging rituals, which may not may include in the procurement of animal sacrifices like uh, pigs, carabals. Actually, it's uh, festive, but this is part of the, their practices. Were not sponsored by the forensic team. Local landowners might object to in, to increase, and it is possible that the host local government will stop investigation in the community unless. The cultural needs of its residents are met. And what is this? The rituals. They will receive help from the local villages if they will do these sacrifices or rituals. So culture is very important. Um, when responsible um, crisis in another country or community, if you're doing respond um, investigation, forensic practitioners must understand the customs and tradition involving the treatment of the dead, okay? Standard forensic practices may need to be modified to fit better with the local culture, okay? In the Philippines, as you can see, this is one of the uh, excavated um, uh, skull. Um, some of the ethno-linguistic groups, pre-colonial, they practice skull binding. So there's the differences between cultural anthropology and the forensic anthropology, because we are actually not just dealing with the bones, not just dealing with, uh, with the uh, skulls, but also the practice itself, okay? So when you say cultural anthropology, as the name suggests, it studies human beings by examining the culture of the different groups. Compared with the physical anthropology, which is also in anthropology, subfields of anthro, in contrast, emphasizes only on the development. But if you are practicing anthropology, forensic anthropology, physical anthropology, of course, you will you need to integrate the cultural anthropology as the name suggests. Okay? So forensic anthropology, most of the time they they are focusing on the osteology, osteological analysis. And forensic anthropologists help to identify individuals who died in mass disasters, war, or due to homicide, suicide, and accidental death. In cultural anthropology, would you believe that some of the group, pre-colonial, or some of the group still practicing the boreal, the secondary primary boreal practices, whereby we are uh, actually um, um, burying the dead and then we assume, clean the bones and put that inside the secondary jar. And that's the work of the cultural anthropologist, not just investigating the crime, not just investigating what happened, but more on the cultural practices that they prepared for those dead bodies. Another important um, subdisciplines of cultural practices in cultural anthropology is the linguistic anthropology, which studies, we all know that it, uh, uh, we need to study the ways in which people negotiate, contest, and reproduce cultural forms 
a social relation through language. They examined the ways uh, which language provides insight in nature and evolution of the human society. Why? In linguistics anthropology, in, uh, in the Philippines, we have this pre-colonial barbarian characters. And why linguistic in, uh, anthropology is important? Because we should be mindful of the language that you use, forensic scientists that you use, and words to be used, as might they have different effects on connotation. This, um, actually, this was my um, experience before when we're doing excavation uh, together with the National Museum in one of the areas of the Philippines. Uh, forensic scientists, you should be cautious in using different terminologies, like for example, undertaker. We all know undertaker is the person who takes the risk and management of the business. But in some cultures, undertaker is one who prepares the dead bodies for burial and arranges and manages the funeral in the Philippines. We all know what is the meaning of salvage. Salvage is to rescue a wreck or disabled ship or its cargo from loss of sea. But in the Philippines, the meaning of salvage is to apprehend and execute a suspected criminal without trial. So linguistics, anthropology, the terminologies that you are using is also important in describing crime. So ask the right question. Um, most of the uh, investigator actually have this, a lot of questions regarding the, uh, the event or the crime. The idea is that um, when conducting um, a specific um, study or investigation in countries is what type, you should know the type of cultural practices that should be considered prior to investigation. You should consider um, questions during or questions to ponder during the investigation like for example what is the uh, cultural condition existing in dealing with the dead are the bar, uh, are the bodies buried or cremated and why will these conditions affect the forensic investigations are these ceremonies that need to be conducted before during and after examinations what are the requirements of such ceremonies? Who needs to be present? And this is important, as required by the cultural religious practices. Is there a time limit and how, how long a body may be examined before being buried or cremated? You cannot just investigate, you take as long as you want, but there are specific rules that have this limitation, time limit of the body to be exposed. In some of the cultural traditions, a member of the family or community is required to watch over a body until burial. Okay? They need to be there to see things, but there's some, some you cannot just uh, be there and looking at the dead bodies. Anyway, it's more cultural. So can cultural tradition work with forensic scientific, scientific protocol or must something give or if yes, and what are those? Is, this is um, uh, questions to ponder, okay? So awareness is the greatest agent for change. As an outsider, it is the forensic team's responsibility to negotiate how differences will be articulated. The forensic team needs to be aware of this expectation and be prepared to negotiate, especially on the unforeseen event, because some of the culture actually uh, they have this um, sense of negotiation, okay? What is the possible action and how to proceed? Culture, we all know that um, is not a monolithic. We are not monolithic. Within the culture, there are several interpretations and what traditions require as it, it is in this space that forensic investigation can engage. So. As you can see in the photo, help give loved one a proper burial. So what uh, constitutes a proper burial? Traditionally, a known individual buried within their family compound. In some of the ethnolinguistic Philippines, actually the, the, um, 
the uh, specific uh, tomes are a forensic investigation must seek a way to provide their services to the population while working with proper burials and spirits. A forensic investigation will fail if it only focuses on the collection and evidences for the prosecution and perpetrators without attempting to identify the remains of the dead. While a measure of justice may be served to offenders, the forensic investigation would not necessarily elevate the anxiety among the survivors regarding the unidentified death and could not exaggerate the feelings to the additional disturbance of death and investigation would cause. So, in the Philippines, these are the protocols in doing investigation. Permission is required, especially if the case is about the indigenous people's case. There are IP indigenous people's issues that uh, may be part of the agreement, which require that disclosure of results like publication needed uh, their permission. As you can see, I'm reading the um, contract prior to my investigation. This is the pre-filled informed consent. Before conducting the study, members of the community need to gather first and will decide if they will allow the study. And this is actually uh, governed by the National Commission on the Indigenous Peoples. We need to apply NCIP Administrative Order Number 1 Series of 2012. At the same time, while doing, while reading the contract within the community, we need to have this permission of the FBIC, a free and prior informed consent in accordance with their respective customary laws and practices. So another, again, they emphasize the language and process understandable to the community. After that, somebody will go there, uh, the representative coming from the NCIP, the investigators, and of course the police to have this field-based investigation or ocular inspection prior to the investigation. Okay? So what are the appropriate methods used for this kind of situation, specifically among the indigenous groups? In the mainstream academic system, copyright is used to ensure permission with the written resources because we all know after this uh, paper, after doing investigation, we um, do publish the result. But for the indigenous groups, we need an oral permission, okay, to use those materials or practices, okay, especially the songs, the stories about those um, departed relatives, and of course the materials that we use. Okay, most some of the practices they even dance, okay, in that particular event or activity. Permission to use such materials or practices may be considered in the context of one's intent and relationship with the owners. So, as you can see, I'm the only person there. Prior to investigation, I need to follow their protocol, and this is part of the ritual. Okay, we are using culturally appropriate research methods. When are, what are those? And these are the participatory action research, cultural sensitivity interviewing models, ethnographic methods or ethnography, participant observation techniques, individual interviews, reference groups as the key community holders. As you can see, Prior to the protocols and collecting samples, I need to do the rituals to appease the spirits, okay? And not to endanger my team also, because that's part of the protocol prior to investigation. Okay, in the burial sites, in investigating the tomb, okay, investigating the particular sites with uh, uh, dead bodies because of the disaster, there's a free uh, fieldwork proper rituals in the burial sites. And this is our, one of the ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines. They are called Manobo. Okay, another in the mountain province, 
And these are very popular. The Philippine fire mummies are still in the list of the world. 100 most endangered heritage. As of now, they are still collecting samples. Okay, during the collection of samples, the following were done to secure the permit, collection of the teeth, skin, hair, and say hair samples from the mummies. Of course, there's a courtesy with the mayor and the elders of the community. Present the research protocol in the community and of course in the local government and allowed uh, to collect uh, that will be. The, they will be allowing us to provide um, a ritual to perform, okay? So what are the materials um, in that particular activity? Um, there's chicken, alcohol, or gin, or wine. Cigarettes were used for the ritual before entering the cave to investigate those mummies because there are a lot of actually activities that we need to investigate, especially during the World War II. In the post field work, you should give the result of validation. Okay, you should give the result for validation. You should give the result to know the terminologies that they are using in referring to death and, of course, in referring to crime. Okay, um, but you cannot show the victim itself, it's a different story. What we're doing is the confirmation that there are actually cases in that particular area. So crime scene, okay? If the aim of the forensic investigation is to help affected population record, recover from war or disaster, their cultural needs must be considered the proper coordination, okay? In doing so, the forensic investigation can provide a catalyst for a change in both forensic and cultural practices, okay? This is a, uh, one of the case in the Philippines during the uh, Yolanda disaster, storm surge, okay? The need uh, for a forensic investigation to gather evidence and to identify dead, which override the need to strictly, there are thousands of people who died during that, um, that um, event. Transparency is also um, important, and of course, mindfulness. Um, we all know that uh, we have to be to update the community from time to time. Okay, the final consideration that forensic responders should be mindful of, in particular in the context of disaster involving the sudden loss of hundreds or thousands of individuals, because most of them they lack knowledge about the body and the scene. Um, this is the Department of Health, and these are the dead bodies, okay? Like what the forensic scientists told us, if you die, you're just um, in the disaster or crime, you're just one of the numbers in that Department of Health body bags, okay? So um, the composing body as a source of poison is very strong among the locals. They believe that um, uh, dead people can cause poison among the living people. Okay. Actually, people are trapped in, who are trapped in disaster are usually safe and not ill, but they die because of this kind of perspective, injuries from and not from the illness. Okay, so uh, this is the event that happened. Uh, the best way, actually, for the forensic professionals is to again get the samples, study, and the best ways uh, to dispose the bodies out of fear of disease because of the reactions of the people, okay? So rather than um, thinking about the storage it's, and the identification capabilities, they need to dispose the bodies uh, ASAP, okay? Although recovery and removal of them is priority, the forensic team should be prepared to address the idea of disease transmission and possible approaches to the development of ad hoc mass graves, because there are a lot of, um, well, in the Philippines, we have this Pusisera, meaning they, they need, they like to ask questions, details in the investigators, okay? Uh, we all know since um, uh, COVID-19 still here in, in our country and all over the world, the Philippines is one of the countries um, 
um, who, are, uh, who were affected by COVID-19. In order to spread the domestic, um, in order to spread those uh, kind of diseases, actually domestic regulation the Philippines called um, expeditious cremation or confirmed suspected COVID-19 victims within the 12 hours of post-mortem. Boreal is actually acceptable but less favored, especially uh, in order to comply with the Islamic funeral laws or areas where there are no crematoria. Okay? But for the Catholic norms actually transported by the, uh, pre, uh, by the Spanish colonizer in the Philippines, we are actually more on the ceremonies to honor the dead and cremation came to be feared, okay? In addition, many funeral um, homes are calling for cremation, even though it is not COVID-19, okay? Or not suspected out abundance of caution. So it's um, not good to die during this COVID-19 because you're one of the candidates to be cremated. And that's the compliance with the government guidelines. Crematoria are rapidly processing cremation, even though they're, they are contrary to the practice of full body internment in the Philippines. Some of the uh, funeral homes in Manila have actually prohibited from um, refusing deceased COVID-19 patients. Okay. The Catholic Bishop uh, Conference in the Philippines has actually adopted the guidelines on and because of change on cremation. And these guidelines include recommendations on holding the funeral mass and rites of the final commendation and committal. According to these guidelines, cremated remains must be buried. This is a Catholic practice and not to be kept in the houses. Of course, it will be uh, this was, of course, in the columbarium and not to be scattered because of the thinking that it can also cause diseases. The urn, actually, they emphasize containing remains must not be um, kept at home. Despite the church acceptance of cremation and its relatively cheaper cost, internment is commonly preferred as burial practice among the Filipinos. Okay, so this... Uh, what uh, we are actually missing now because of this cremation. The usual funerary rites often including ho uh, holding a wake in the residence of the deceased with a brief, uh, brief hosting uh, novenas, nightly prayers, and offering masses of the dead, and about three days concluding with the inhumation uh, uh, at the cemetery. The long-standing misconception spread of pathogens and miasma from dead bodies, prompt hygiene during infectious disease, actually using PPE if um, the person died with COVID-19. Actually, it's more historical in the Philippines. That's why we are scared about the perception of cremation. Why? Because part of the history in the Philippines, a lot of people died because of the cholera, okay? and the aversion, and because of this disease uh, containment, um, the Americans actually um, use cremation to uh, sanitize the, the communities. And this, uh, this is uh, actually during the 20th century, okay? So most of the houses actually were burned, okay? Because of the directives of the U US uh, colonial administration, um, the entire Manila actually were burned uh, with, um, with the fear of um, infection. Okay, so this is the publish of uh, Dr. Francis Gialogo, a historian that most of the uh, houses in the different communities actually were burned because of the uh, pandemic. And of course, there are um, detention centers for sick were also built. And the Filipinos actually uh, feared this detention and of, of course, the fear of burning their houses. So uh, the ordinance actually with infected bodies um, um, should be in a sealed metallic con um, coffin. 
because some of the communities are poor, unable to afford sealed um, coffins, and afraid of cremation, Filipinos preferred to dispose of their department, departed by throwing them into the river or burying them within the grounds of their home. So there are practices that until now, they bury their, um, actually their departed relatives with a tome in their house, especially among the ethno-linguistic groups. Here, as you can see, the cadavers are treated with a standard PPE and when the special contact, so that the, uh, uh, they need to have this special uh, uh, physical contact should be minimized. So they, there, are, there have been no confirmed cases of viral um, transmission from a dead body anywhere in the Philippines and of course in the world. Okay, today, especially the Filipinos, people use war, actually it's like a war during the American time as a metaphor for describing turbulence brought by COVID-19. The cholera epidemic in the Philippines during the early years of American colonization unfolded as a literal war as a newly colonized Filipino struggle against armed conflict and disease. In this actual war, mass cremation of dead was a weapon to subjugate or subjugation that intertwined America's pacification campaign in the island. One of the picture, this is uh, from the um, Indonesia. Okay, do not burn our bodies. Burial is our right. So it's more of the information this Indonesia regarding the uh, perspective about dead people. Okay, so trained or cultivated are um, trained uh, forensic professionals or untrained professionals. Uh, um, forensic professionals, if uh, cultural va values are identified uh, at crime scenes, it is important that the victim's family be included in trying to elevate conflicting values between forensic science and the cultural values of the family. To end, by investigating how this loss contributes to the historical and ethnographic backgrounds of management and death, combine perspectives from for, uh, forensic science and cultural anthropology can be used to suggest the possibility of honoring disease in a culturally sensitive way, even this um, turbulent time. And these are the references. Magsukal, thank you in the language of the Banavos. Thank you so much. <laughs>